Hi, we've uh, decided that we're going to be promoting prayer here at Central in a, maybe a different way than we're used to. Our entire church is going to be working through this book, How to Pray, by Pete Gregg. Uh, Pete has an extra letter in his last name, go figure, G-R-E-I-G. This simple guide for normal prayer is something that works for us as a church uh, different groups that are already in place, or maybe couples or families, or or maybe even a couple of households that are in the same bubble can work through eight video courses, eight different sections that go along with this book. We're planning to start this as a staff. We're committing to do this in our staff meetings, and we're also inviting the rest of our congregation to do the same thing, uh, beginning in a couple of weeks in, in mid October. And Terry Hansen has more information about that. If you'd like to email her and get some information, that'd be terrific. Today, we're going to drive down the road that Pastor Joel paved for us these last months in the New Testament book of Acts. And we're going to stop at some landmarks. A bunch of different places, but if you've got your Bibles, I'd like for you to turn to Acts. And if you need to pause right now and go get your Bible, that'd be great. I want to first read from the first chapter. Now, this is after the death and resurrection of Jesus. It's after his ascension where he's left them. And we read of the early Jesus followers, Acts 1, verse 14, they all met together and were constantly united in prayer, along with Mary, the mother of Jesus, several other women and the brothers of Jesus. Constantly united in prayer, the verses say. They were being attentive to prayer. They were persevering in prayer. They, were, they had this constant readiness to pray. They were devoting themselves to prayer. They'd been separated from Jesus physically, and now they were resorting to prayer as a primary means of communication with the Lord. And then, not many days later, we read in Acts 2.42, All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Prayer, and, here it is, and to prayer. They devoted themselves, among other things, to prayer. Now you think about Acts 1.14 and Acts 2.42, and they sandwich a momentous event in church history. That is the Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit, the inauguration of the church. So both before and after the permanent presence of the Holy Spirit, these Jesus followers, they prayed hard. The first Jesus followers, they prayed regularly and continually and, and persistently. Prayer was their go-to play. Not only did the early church model devoted praying, they were exhorted to be all in. Paul wrote in the book of Colossians, chapter 4, verse 2, devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. The takeaway is that Jesus' followers give constant attention to prayer. They stay fixed in prayer. They exercise prevailing power in prayer. They overcome in prayer. They prayed hard. The question that I think is for us, do we pray hard? Do we pray as habitually as we drink coffee or watch the news? Do we, do we pray as repeatedly as we check our phones? Do we pray as sincerely as we defend our favorite sports franchise or our particular political view? Do we pray with as much dedication as we work out? Well, let's do some more sightseeing in Acts. Acts 4 records the church's first brush with murderous threats from community bullies, from religious leaders. I think they knew it wouldn't be their last. And we read in Acts 4, verse 23, Luke, the historian, writes these words, as soon as they were freed, Peter and John returned to the other believers and told them what the leading priests and elders had said. When they heard the report, all the believers lifted their voices together in prayer to God, and they reminded themselves and they reminded God that he had spoken a long time before then that enemies would come against the people of God. And in verse 27, in their prayer, they continue, this has happened here in this very city, they pray. For Herod Antipas, Pontius Pilate, the governor, 
the Gentiles, and the people of Israel were all united against Jesus, your holy servant, whom you anointed. Their prayer continues. But everything they did was determined beforehand according to your will. And now here's their request. O oh Lord, hear their threats and give us your servants great boldness in preaching your word. Stretch out your hand with healing power. They were asking now that there would be these authenticating signs of the people of Jesus, the followers of Jesus, just like there were authenticating signs on Jesus and his deity and his power, his, his divinity, his, his divine ability to accomplish these tremendous miracles in front of their eyes. And now they're praying for the same so that their message would have a, an audience, would have a hearing. Verse 31 then says, after this prayer, the meeting place shook, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And they preached, they asked to have boldness in preaching, and the verse tells us they preached the word of God with boldness. Later, in Acts chapter 6, the church reminded themselves that leaders must, must spend their time in prayer. Acts 6, flip there, a few pages over. As the believers multiplied rapidly, there were rumblings of discontent. The Greek-speaking believers complained about the Hebrew-speaking believers, saying that their widows were being discriminated against in the daily distribution of food. And Pastor Joel explained that so well last week. If you didn't hear it, go back and, and uh, listen to it, watch it. So the 12 called a meeting of all the believers, and they said, we apostles should spend our time teaching the Word of God, not running a food program. And so, brothers, select seven men who are well-respected and are full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, and we will give them this responsibility, a key, an important responsibility. Then we apostles, verse 4 says, can spend our time doing what? In prayer and teaching the Word. Remember, they didn't have the compilation of the Greek New Testament nor the nor the the Hebrew Old Testament. It hadn't been collected like we have the 66 books of the Hebrew and Greek scriptures. So they needed to spend time making sure that they were hearing from God as they were revealing God these new truths for this, this new way, this new thing of Christianity, followers of Christ. Well, the early church in verse 5, Acts 6, says they liked the idea. They, they chose the following, Stephen, Philip, some others. These seven men were presented to the apostles and they were prayed for and they laid their hands on them. Verse 7 tells us God's message continued to spread and the number of believers increased greatly in Jerusalem and many of the Jewish priests were converted as well. Now let me stop here and, and let's talk about 2020. When we look around with 2020 vision we discover that we have more in common with the churches in Acts than we used to. We read in Acts 4.27 that the foes were united against Jesus, and it seems like that's happening now. Our world is being jerked around by spiritual, physical, and, and social forces. The pandemic has exposed the church's frailties. The social instability has highlighted the church's missteps and, and general ineffectiveness. The church in America is at a crossroads, maybe even at an impasse. The capital C church has monumental decisions to make, and, and this church in the midway is not exempt. Status quo, life as we knew it, isn't going to promote the spread of God's message like it used to. So, so what do we do? Well, let's get back on our sightseeing tour. This time, let's go to Acts 13. Let's read from Acts 13, where it says, Among the prophets and teachers of the church at Antioch of Syria, the church in Jerusalem planted another church in Antioch. It was a satellite congregation. And in that church, prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, Lucius, Manaen, Saul, one day as these men were worshiping, verse 2 tells us, as these men were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy, the Holy Spirit said, appoint Barnabas and Saul for the special work to which I have called them. 
Now, these leaders may have been feeling directionless or, or confused. They had no vision, maybe we could say. The leadership at Antioch, that entire team was paralyzed by the lack of a game plan. They knew that they were to carry the, the gospel message to the ends of the earth. They had they had heard Jesus. They had heard other people tell what Jesus had said in recorded in Acts 1 8 about taking the good news to Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the remotest parts of the earth. They were committed leaders. They had been tested by trials. These spiritual giants were, were dedicated, but they didn't know what to do next. They knew to worship and they knew to fast. I think that there's a couple of principles here, and that is when, when we're looking for a breakthrough, Let's pray hard. And along with that, when we're looking for people to lead the breakthrough, let's pray hard. Back to Acts 13. This time I'm reading verse 3. So after more fasting and prayer, the men laid their hands on Barnabas and Saul and sent them on their way so Barnabas and Saul were sent out by the Holy Spirit. And then we read of Saul and Barnabas on their first missionary trip. We read in Acts 14, verse 23, that they appointed elders in every church. With prayer and fasting, they turned the elders over to the care of the Lord in whom they had put their trust. They turned the elders over to the care of the Lord. In other words, they, they set them before the Lord. And later in Acts 14, verse 26, they they returned to Antioch of Syria, where their ministry had begun, their, their, their journey, their missionary trip had begun. And we read that the believers there had entrusted them to the grace of God to do work that they had now completed. So the elders were turned over to the care of the Lord, just like Barnabas and Saul had been turned over to the, to the grace of God. They were delivered over to God for God to keep, for God to use, for God to take care of them. I remember when I was a, a, a young dad and my firstborn, her, her name's Jill, when she was old enough to go to kindergarten, we made sure that we got to know the principal and the teachers of the school, and, and our little girl had some friends from our church that were also going to the same school. But the first day was a rough day for me. I took Jill down to the corner and we turned west and walked a block and then we turned south and walked another block and then west again and there in a block and a half was Walnut School. My job as her dad on the first day of school was to turn her over to this crazy place. Well, this was when, when schools were where Bunches of students, like dozens, even hundreds of students, would gather in the same building, and they would have classes together. Crazy time. <laughs> well, what I did was I turned Jill over to those, those school leaders, and I did it the day after, and the day after that. The day after that, for many days, and sometimes her mom, Linda, walked her there and turned her over. In the same way, the early church, they turned their leaders, their breakthrough leaders, over to God. And they, they asked for, for God to take care of them, for God to use them, for, for God to look out for them. They entrusted these ministers and their ministry to God's favor to God's protection. And amazing things happened. You know, before Acts 13, the, the gospel message went outside of Jerusalem, maybe a couple hundred miles. But the Acts 13 events catapulted Christianity out of obscurity to the, to the rest of the known world. It became the dominant religion in the Roman Empire. And this was before printed media. This was before TV. This was before the internet. This was before smartphones. Within a couple, two or three hundred years, Christianity, the, the gospel message of Jesus Christ had, had been spread across the known world. They prayed hard. 
They prayed hard for a breakthrough, and they prayed hard for breakthrough leaders, and God granted them their requests. And so I'm asking today that we pray hard for our leaders, for our lay leaders here at Central, or for your church, if you're watching this from another congregation. Pray hard for our lay leaders. Pray hard for our ministry partners, those who serve on our behalf in other parts of the metro area or the state of Minnesota or in other parts of the world. Pray hard for our staff. And pray hard for Pastor Next. We don't even know what his name is. We don't know who might be coming here to, to lead this church. We pray hard for the pastor who comes after my interim ministry. Now I realize there are other kinds of prayers, and and this book by by Pete Gregg will will give us some of those uh, suggestions. I mean, there's contemplation and there's confession. And, We'll cover those during this fall as we work through this book. But today I'm calling us to advance our breakthrough prayers, to advance our breakthrough leader prayers. And now I've got a bonus lesson from these verses. These verses that, that we've been uh, looking at and we've been doing some sightseeing from. Breakthrough prayers are often linked to fasting. Did you notice that in the verses we read? And these first Jesus followers, they practiced a long-held, long-used activity, or I guess maybe really it's a non-activity of, of, of fasting. I'm going to ask you to agree or disagree with the statement. Here it is. Fasting makes prayer potent. Maybe you even want to pause, and if you're watching this with somebody else in the room, dialogue, argue, share opinions, agree or disagree. Fasting makes prayer potent. Okay, we're back. Uh, you, you're probably wondering, well, What's, what's Steve going to, oh, is, does Steve agree or disagree? I, I'm not going to go there. Instead, what I'm going to say is this. Not fasting doesn't strip our prayers of their potency. In both the Old and the New Testament, fasting is linked to serious, intense, effective prayers. People who pray hard are people who fast and pray. Is fasting the secret ingredient? Is it the magic bullet? Is it what makes prayer efficacious, to use a medical term? Does it weaponize our prayers? The Bible doesn't explain the connection between prayer and fasting. Fasting is a common practice of effective prayers. And in Acts, there was this correlation between fasting and praying, but there wasn't a causation. There was, it's not like fasting caused breakthrough prayers, but breakthrough prayers were associated with fasting. Because fasting helps focus our prayers and it gives our praying a faith-filled resolve. Now, I want you to understand that we can fast from more than just food. We can give up TV and caffeine and sports and, and social media. And during these crazy COVID times, we, we've learned to abstain from hugs and handshakes. We, we can't have coffee with, uh, with the crew with the club at Caribou, potluck dinners and all you can eat buffets are banned in some cities. We've been conditioned to fast from some things. So this might be the easiest time than ever to fast and pray. You can use your hunger pangs or your abstinence from some of your other habits as a reminder to pray for a, a whole day or to pray for a few days at, at a certain time of every day. You know, back in Jesus' day, Preparing a meal took a long time. I remember when I was in the Ivory Coast, I was watching a goat run around uh, this 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 little homestead, and and then it wasn't more than a couple of hours later that we were actually eating that goat. It took a long time. It took a lot of people to prepare a meal for us as American guests in the Ivory Coast. And we can save a lot of time if we're not eating and we're not fixing food and we're not cleaning up, and we can use that time to pray. 
Fasting can bring whole groups of believers under the influence of the Holy Spirit, or couples, or families, or whole churches. Uh, Jesus didn't discourage group fasts any more than he discouraged group prayers. He just wanted the, his, in the Sermon on the Mount, he, he wanted the listeners to understand that if you fasted so that you'd get some kudos, you'd slip into the good graces of other believers, of other God followers, well, that's all the reward you were going to get. Let's make one more stop in Acts. Acts 17. Acts 17, 1 to 6. It tells us that Paul and Silas had traveled to the towns of Amphipolis and Apollonia, and then they came to Thessalonica. And Paul read the scriptures, and he reasoned with the people, and he explained the prophecies, and he proved that Messiah must suffer and rise from the dead. And people believed, and people received, and people followed into this kingdom life led by Jesus, the new and coming king. Some of the Jews, verse 5 tells us, were jealous, and they, they gathered some troublemakers from the marketplace to form a mob and to start a riot. They yelled, they shouted, Paul and Silas have caused trouble all over the world, and now they are here disturbing our city too. They've caused trouble all over the world. They're disturbing our city. Paul and Silas were portrayed as troublemakers. They were, they were changing, literally, they were changing the world from going up to going down. That, that's the word that's used here. But it's not like they were turning the world upside down. They were turning the world right side up. And it was there, this is revolutionary. This is proof of the revolutionary power of the Holy Spirit working through Jesus' followers. It says that they'd caused trouble all over the known world. They were turning the world right side up because of their breakthrough prayers and their breakthrough prayers for leaders who would lead these breakthroughs. Now, 2020 is groaning for us to pray upside down prayers, breakthrough prayers, right side up prayers. God can use central. God wants to use central as he has in the past. He wants to use central in the future. In the present. There's a story told by Yogi Berra, you know, the famous baseball catcher, I believe of the Yankees, right? Uh, there's a story that it was a tied game, bottom of the ninth, two runs out, and Yogi Berra, the catcher, was crushed behind home plate. The opposing batter came up, and before he dug in, he took his bat and he made the sign of the cross on home plate. When Yogi Bear saw that, he got up from his crouched position and he took his fat catcher's mitt and he wiped off home plate and, and he looked up at the batter and he said, uh, let's just let God watch this one. You know, there's times that we get to the place where we're just kind of inviting God to watch what we're doing instead of really praying hard. He's the one working. He's the one accomplishing his purposes. Here at Central, here in the Midway, here in the Metro, here in Minnesota, here in the United States, here in the rest of the world. Mac Lucado says, Prayer only makes sense when you have quit trying to do ministry yourself. I've learned that as things go smoothly, I pray less. As our goals shrink, I pray less. As things become more manageable, I pray less. But as we reach out, stretch ourselves, and tackle God-sized dreams, I pray more. Twenty twenty is the year for us to pray hard for breakthroughs and for breakthrough leaders. Let's do it. God, I ask for you 
to accomplish your purposes, to accomplish your kingdom ministries through us. 2020 hasn't been easy for any of us. It hasn't been easy for churches around the world and especially in America. It hasn't been easy for Central. But it reminds us how much we need you. And so we come to you asking for you to break through to our community through us and through our leaders. For your glory, we pray these things in the matchless name of Jesus Christ.